This morning we wrap up our series in groundwork. We've been in groundwork for the last few weeks, and JB and Ricky and I have walked through what it looks like for us to do the hard work of tilling the soil of our hearts to prepare ourselves for what we're hoping to be a fall, that God would rain down his blessings on us and cause increase in growth, not only in our church, but in our lives. So JB hits a little bit on stewardship. Ricky hits hard on what the gospel is. I've talked about intimacy with Jesus. And this morning, we turn our attention to the last week, uh, and we're going to talk about the holiness of God. But before we uh, turn to our text, I just want to kind of give you guys a roadmap for where we're going to be going this fall. JB, Ricky, and I are super excited about a new series that we're going to be starting next week. Uh, And this fall, for the next 11 or so weeks, 10 or 11 weeks, we're going to be looking at the book of Galatians. And within the book of Galatians, we're going to be looking at what God's words to us are about not only what the gospel is, uh, the interplay between faith and works, the interplay between law and gospel, but we're also going to be spending uh, some dedicated time talking about race. And and talking about race not in a way that would be inflammatory, uh, but talking about race in a way that's biblical. Uh, Talking about race in a way that honors what God is doing in our fellowship Uh, but also looking to talk about race to continue in educating us and ourselves about what the Bible has to say. So looking at passages of when Paul confronts Peter about his seeming duplicity in the face of Jews and Gentiles and how that translates to us in 2016. Uh, Quite simply, y'all ain't going to want to miss this. Um, uh, We're going to be tackling hard things. We're going to be talking uh, and tackling things like white fragility and privilege, but also pride and arrogance and, and real issues uh, in, in the black community and the white community in our nation as a whole. But rather than talking about those issues, those particularities in and of themselves, we want to ground everything we say in the word of God, because if we do not stand on the word of God, we have nothing to stand on. Amen. So we're going to be looking at that, and then we're going to finish the series of Galatians looking at what it looks like for us to live a spirit-filled life, and not spirit-filled in the, in the Benny Hinn, bodies hit the floor kind of way, but uh, spirit-filled as in the spirit who indwells us, fills us uh, uh, for the work of the ministry and for the edification of the church. So that's kind of where we're going this fall. I'm really, like, I'm real excited about it. Uh, this will be the first long series that I get with you all, and I'm, I'm really excited about that um, and excited about what the Lord's going to do this fall. So without further ado, would you take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, as I said earlier, we're finishing the series in Groundwork, and we turn our attention to Isaiah chapter 6, which is a very familiar passage of Scripture, but we're going to be looking at it in a way that hopefully we uncover something surprising about God and about our petitions and what we ask of God. Isaiah chapter 6, we're going to read verses 1 through verse 8. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through verse 8. When you get there, give me a macho man, Randy Savage. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Somebody really got into that. Amen. Yes, indeed. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 reads, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated upon the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him stood seraphim. Each had six wings, two to cover their face, two to cover their feet, and two to fly with. And they cried back and forth to one another, And saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The entire earth, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the thresholds and the foundation shook. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Isaiah, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I live amongst the people of unclean lips. And yet my eyes have seen the king The Lord of hosts, I am lost. And then one of the seraphim flew to me, having taken from the altar tongs, and he touched my lips and he said, Behold, 
This has touched your lips. Your sin is atoned for. Your guilt is taken away. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. This is the word of the Lord. And before considering it, we should pray. So let us pray. Father in heaven, grant us this morning the great privilege to see you, to behold you in our lives as Isaiah had where once he saw you, his life was never the same. Grant us, Father, a revelation of yourself that would simultaneously terrify us and leave us in awe, but that would also call us into mission for you. Jesus, we know that we have seen God when we've seen you. In John 10, you say, all who have seen me have seen my Father. You are the exact likeness of your daddy. You are the exact imprint of his nature. And we behold the face of God in you, Jesus. So I pray, Jesus, that you would be exalted this morning, that you would be lifted high, and that you would draw all men to yourself by the heralding of your goodness. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord. We love you. It's your name we pray. Amen. If you've lived any considerable amount of time, you understand the concept of faith is a difficult concept. After all, we live in a world where our physical eyes provide us all the proof we need that something exists. I see the whites of your eyes, which means that I know you exist. I see the chairs you sit in, which means that I know you exist. I see the clock that's telling me how much time I have, and some of you are praying that I don't go over my time. But if you lived long enough and you understand faith, then you understand that the difficulty about our faith is that we serve and worship a God whom we cannot regularly, regularly see with our eyes. And so we, we tend to pray prayers like, Lord, show us yourself. Lord, show me yourself. Lord, give us more of you. I remember being a, a young lad, around eight or nine years old, and I was watching 2020 with Barbara Walters because that's what you do at eight years old. I was watching 2020, and Barbara was having a one-on-one interview with a woman who had this amazing experience where she had died, and she had ascended up into heaven. And there uh, was in, in this story, she was talking about what heaven looked like and what angels looked like and They even had an artist's rendering of her description of what heaven looked like. You can imagine what that looks like with technology in the early 90s, but at the time it was revolutionary. Today it looks like somebody drew some neon vectors on a black screen and called it heaven. It's ridiculous. But then, you know, I'd be at my grandmother's house and my grandmother would always watch TBN. My grandmama loves Jimmy Swagger. And from time to time on TBN they would have these interviews with people who would claim to have seen angels or they would claim to have seen Jesus or claim to have seen God. And I can remember wrestling with my faith so deeply that I said, God, it's so hard for me to believe, but if you only sent me an angel, I would believe in you. God, if you only came down, I mean, I know you're busy, but could you not just take time out of your busy schedule to come and show yourself to me so that I know you're real? Because in the midst of my life, God, I I really don't feel you. I really don't see you. It's hard for me to have faith when I don't even know that you're there for sure. So I would pray prayers like, show me your glory. 
show me your glory? Which is, in fact, the title of this sermon, Show Me Your Glory? It is a question posed in the face of us who would ask God to show himself to us. Show me your glory? My friends, I I, I wonder if we don't really know what we're asking for, because if we receive what Isaiah receives here in chapter 6, we shall never pray such prayers. There's three things here that I think this text lends to us that we can glean from this morning. As we move into talking about the holiness of God, one, we see the revelation of God's glory. Two, we see the terror of God's glory. And three, we see the response to God's glory. So one, the revelation of God's glory. Two, the terror of God's glory. And three, the response to God's glory. Isaiah opens up in verse 1. He says, in the year that King Uzziah died, King Uzziah was a big dog in the kingdom of Israel. He was a good king up until the last of his days. Nonetheless, his legacy remained. So when he says, in the year that King Uzziah died, he pinpoints this ecstatic experience in a very crucial time of Israel's history. Uh, It would be something like, in the year that JFK was assassinated, in the year that Dr. King was assassinated, Uh, in, in a year of tumult, in a year of uncertainty, in a year when we were unsure about the way ahead. I'm in the temple. And the commonness of the temple fades away as God ushers me into his presence. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated high and lifted up and the train of his robe. God has chosen to divinely reveal himself to Isaiah. And this is such a, this is such a, a unique passage of Scripture because when you read this, you see, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, but we don't know anything about what Yahweh looks like. We only have a description of the train of his robe. This is because I think Isaiah, in the presence of God, as we will see in about four verses, Isaiah is so terrified that he's on his face in the presence of God, afraid to look up, and the only thing he can see is the hem of God's garment. And the hem of God's garment is so big that Isaiah might say to himself, if his hem looks like this, how big must he be? So Isaiah is... Afraid to look up, but what he does notice out of the corner of his eyes is he sees this, these seraphim, these angelic messengers with three sets of wings who were encircling the throne of God. And this lets you know how amazing God is. These beings are encircling the throne of God perpetually for all of eternity And God is so magnificent. They have one word to describe him, and they have to say it three times to even begin to scratch the surface of his grandeur. Holy, holy, holy. Kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. The holiness of God. And holiness is is not just like The towels my mama had in the bathroom that were for decoration that you couldn't use to wash your hands. Holiness was not just the special underwear that I would wear for game days. Holiness refers to the uniqueness of God, the set-apartness of God. You see, you can talk about LeBron James being a unique basketball player, and yes, he is unique in the sense of no one can do what he can do, but we know what a basketball player is because we see other humans with two feet and two legs that are playing basketball. There's Steph Curry, and there's Kevin Durant, and there's Chris Conley, and there's all these other people that are basketball players. So really, he might be unique as maybe an individual, but there's other things like him. You could talk about the DeLorean from Back to the Future, and we could talk about how unique that car is. There's not many of them driving on the road, but 
even though, like, I don't drive a DeLorean, like, I still have a vehicle that's got four wheels and it's got a hood and it's got a windshield. It's still something that's like that car. And I can glean a little bit of what the DeLorean is like based off of what I drive. But God is such that there is nothing else in the universe by which we can compare him to. In his divine sovereignty, he has given us anthropomorphisms. He describes himself like a human as a, as a father, as a shepherd, with a, with a face and with hands and with feet, so that we can begin to wrap our minds around what he's like. But my friends, God is so much more than that. These angels are left relegated to the trisagion, trisagion, tri three times, hagion, the word holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. That word in the Hebrew is the kavod of God. It's kavod, it's heaviness, it's weightiness, it's importance. We would refer to this as gravitas. Have you ever walked in a room with someone and that person has gravitas? It would be like the president walks in here and even though you don't like his social policy, he's still the president and he demands our respect. He walks in the room and every head turns. God and the weight of God and the glory of God, it's it's weighty. When the Bible speaks that before God, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Uh, The reason I think every knee will bow is because the presence of God quite literally has weight to it and no one's able to stand in his presence. Which is why Isaiah, I think, is here on his face in the presence of God saying, uh, God is so heavy, he's so big, he's so glorious, the whole earth is full of his Glory, my friends, when God reveals himself to you, when God reveals himself to us through his word in the form of Jesus Christ, he is not some trivial character. He is not your BFF. He is not your co-pilot. He is not a big voice in the sky. He is Yahweh. He has no equal His presence, when he chooses to reveal himself to you, will leave you speechless and in terror. Show me your glory? Do we really know what it is that we're asking for? A.W. Tozer says this. He says, a person who has sensed what Isaiah sensed will never be able to joke about the man upstairs or the someone up there who likes me. God is not some friend that you sidle up next to like you would a chum at a football game. He is holy. When Moses is on the mountain with God and Moses says, God, show me your glory, God says, baby boy, you don't know what you're asking for. He says, I'm not going to show you my glory. What is Moses asking for? Moses is literally saying, almost quite literally rendered in the Hebrew, God, show me the real you. You see, God's glory is the outward manifestation of his holiness. Who God is at his core is his holiness. His glory is the external manifestation of his Holiness. So when Moses is asking to see the glory of God, what he's really asking to see is the holiness of God. And God is like, "Uh uh-uh, can't nobody see the true me and live. No man can see the true me and live. So what does God say? I'm going to hide you in the cleft of this rock. I'm going to put my hand over you, and I'm going to pass my glory by you. I'm going to pass the, the, the residual effects of my holiness beside you. And even the residual effects of God's holiness, his inner true most character, his being, was enough to illumine Moses' face for months. The divine revelation of God, when God reveals himself to us, he changes us, which leads to the second point, the terror of God's glory. Uh, verse 
4 opens up when the foundations and the thresholds shook and the house was filled with smoke. Again, anytime you see the presence of God accompanied by physical phenomenon, physical manifestations like smoke, like earthquake, like thunder or lightning, it is referred to as epiphany. It is a signal and a clue that the king of heaven is on the scene. So the foundations shake. So here's Isaiah on his face before the Lord. He's hearing these seraphim cry out to God. The voice, their voices in crying out to God are so loud that it's literally shaking everything in there. The house fills up with smoke. Wait a minute, God, it's a fire in here. The presence of God, the holiness of God. And then Isaiah says what he says in verse 5. Woe is me. I am am ruined. Woe is me, I am ruined. In an instant, Isaiah realizes that he is insufficient to be standing in the presence of Yahweh. He realizes that he is trotting an area where he has no business. Isaiah is in a place where he knows he has just been privy to something that demands his life because the purity of God, the weightiness of God is present with his sinfulness. I'm a man of unclean lips and I live amongst the people of unclean lips and yet my eyes have seen the king. I am ruined. He is going to die. In his mind, he is going to to die. He knows he doesn't deserve to be here. And there are a lot of people who will tell you that there is no grace in the Old Testament, but my friends, there is grace here. How is it that the king of the universe allows a mortal man a particular experience in his presence and allows him to live? My friends, this is the common condition of us all. God, in his divine holiness, reserves the right to smash us. We all deserve death, but yet instead of death, he gives us life. Instead of death, he gives us grace. Instead of being just in his wrath being poured upon us, he gives us mercy. You see, before the presence of God, my friends, we are all ruined We are all lost. We have no footing on which to stand unless God himself would show us his mercy. Salvation will always be something that you've accomplished as long as you have a small view of God that says God does what I tell him to do. Your view of salvation will always be based on you, and it's why you have no assurance. It's why you pray constantly for God to continue to save your soul. It's why you continue to ask the Lord to not smash you. And it's why, after all these years, you still question whether or not you're saved. Because, baby, implicitly you really believe that the reason that you're saved and what keeps you saved is what you do. What saves you and what keeps you is the same thing that preserves Isaiah from losing his life, and that is grace. When I was eight years old and I'm praying that prayer, God, show me your glory, what I was really saying was, God, I believe that salvation depends on how good I am. And I cussed at school, and I looked at that girl, and I lied to my parents, and I know that I'm not fit or worthy to be saved. So what I need you to do is come absolve me. I need to come to church so I can get a shower and get a bath, only to go back out in the world to get dirty again. And then once I get dirty again, then I'm going to be coming right back to you asking for another sign because your words to me in the Bible that say you have been saved by grace and this is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God because I don't really believe that, my friends. As long as you believe that salvation is something that you do, you will always be in flux, in doubt, and you'll always be asking for signs. When instead, what you really need is you need to be terrified by the glory and the holiness of God. There is mercy and there's grace 
here? And what is the response when God reveals himself in this way? What is the response? The response to God's glory is mission. I like the Trinitarian implications here in verse 7 and 8. When God says, and whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Don't miss that third person, personal, plural pronoun. The us there refers to God and his Trinitarian existence. That is God the Father, God the Son, and God and the Holy Spirit. Again, the Trinity, the word itself may not be in our Bible, but the, the, the evidence of it is here. And so here, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah can't help himself. Here am I. Send me. Send me. In the movie Shrek, during the credits, you've got Donkey that's jumping up and down saying, pick me, pick me. Pick me, pick me, please. Pick me. Hey, pick me. It's like the gunner in the elementary school or middle school class that knows every answer the teacher has. And so every time the teacher asks a question, this little girl or this little boy is raising their hands. Ooh, pick me. I know. I know. It's almost like Isaiah has somehow found some holy boldness to speak in the presence of God. And from his face, he says, Lord, you're so beautiful. I have no other desire to do anything else except for be at your service. The glory of God and the holiness of God. Once we see it, it calls us into mission. And it calls us for the abandonment of self for the advancement of God's glory. So we've been talking about glory in the sense of God's glory as in the external, manifest, external manifestations of his inward holiness. But now I'm talking about glory in the sense of God's fame, God's praise, God's reputation in all of the earth. Now, when you've seen the glory of God, baby, you can't help but to go and tell everybody and they mom and them about how good God is. In, 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 our, in our lives in 2016, Lord, send me a sign. Lord, show me a sign. God, show me more of yourself. We're still trying to cut corners of faith because we don't really believe these words in the book. So what does that look like for us today? It looks like when you see Jesus, who is God himself, who, remember, God is spirit. God doesn't have a face or hands, but he describes himself in that way so that we can understand him? You see, his descriptions of himself are okay, but when he actually takes himself and puts himself in human flesh, now all of a sudden the picture starts to become in focus. That when we see Jesus, we behold the face of God, and when we see Christ, he's not just some moral teacher, some good fella. Jesus ain't just my co-pilot. He's not just my Lord, the one that saves me of my sin but can't tell me what to do. No, he becomes Lord. He becomes Savior. He is lamb and lion. You can't have half of them. You got to have all of them. And when we see that Christ himself has borne the punishment for all of our sin, that we see that when we're in the presence of God and there he is, seated high and lifted up, and the train of his robe fills the temple, and here we are on the floor. The reason that God doesn't smash us is because Jesus is standing over us, receiving the just punishment for our presence in the holiness of God. Jesus is standing there, and he's received the due punishment. Yes, no man may see God and live unless that man is given spiritual eyes to see, by which I will give you spiritual eyes to see what is faith Faith is the spiritual eyeballs by which we see God. <laughs> My life is a life of grace. You know whose else's life was a life of grace? Paul in Acts chapter 9. Paul still breathing threats, still breathing threats against the church, still persecuting people. Paul, Paul was a terrorist. What is a terrorist? A terrorist is a person who takes life and property in the sake of religion. Paul killed people for the sake of religion. Paul was a terrorist. Paul was ISIS before ISIS existed. And here is Paul killing people in Acts chapter 7. 
is Stephen. Acts chapter 8, verse 1, and in a standing in approval of Stephen's murdering was Saul. Saul was there. It was Paul before his name changed. In chapter 9, he has an experience on the road to Damascus where he is blinded by what? <laughs> the glory of Jesus Christ. And in the glory of Jesus Christ, his words aren't, hey, who are you? His words are, Lord. It's funny how that happens, isn't it? You want to ignore that he's there, but then he shows up, and you can't help but to recognize that God is speaking directly to you. And Paul, Saul, Saul says, Lord, Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to transform you from being a, a, a persecutor of my church to being the one who's going to be the greatest promoter of my church. So he blinds Paul. Paul's feeling his way around in the dark, feeling the weight of his sin, God, Jesus gives him his sight back, and all of a sudden, when Jesus essentially asks, whom shall I send, who will go for me, Paul is like, here, me, it's me. I'll take lashes for you, I'll be naked for you, I'll be shipwrecked for you, I'll be kicked out of cities for you, I will be slandered because of you, people will spit in my face because of you, mom and them gonna make fun of me because of you, my friends ain't want nothing to do with me because of you, the nation will persecute me because of you, but you know what, I don't care because you're that glorious. You were infinitely beautiful and infinitely worth anything that I would walk through to be maligned for your name's sake. My friends, God is worth every hardship we ever walk through. And when he calls us to himself by the work and the grace of Jesus Christ, we don't just find a God who is seated high and lifted up. We find a God who gets off of his throne and becomes lowly and poor so that he might identify with us. And that when that low and poor man identifies and dies and is raised, baby, it's the truth that he came as a lamb first, but he's coming as a lion next. And the lamb was willingly led to the slaughter, the poor little cute lamb, the martyr of Jesus. But my friends, he's coming as a lion next. And you know what you don't do with a lion? You don't negotiate with a lion. And you know what you're going to get with the lion? If you think your salvation depends on what you do, then when you stand before the presence of God, God is going to be, oh, oh, it was all about you, wasn't it? Okay, so you make yourself clean in my presence, and there you will have the same reaction that Isaiah had, which is, woe is me. But in Christ. <laughs> but in Jesus Christ, we find grace. We find mercy. We find the terrifying reality of God's glory. But we find forgiveness that leads us to a place where we say, how could I not give you everything that I have because you're worth every little bit of it? My prayer for us as we close this series is that when we pray prayers like, Lord, let me see your glory, two things happen. One, we realize how terrifying that prayer is. But two, that we would realize that the assurance of who Christ is in the Bible would be enough for our faith to truly believe. And that we wouldn't clamor and ask for signs and signs only, but that our prayer, rather than show me your glory, would be Jesus Show me more of you. Let's pray. Father, this morning, to see you is to know you, to see you is to love you. And so, Lord, if there are people who are here who have never seen you, who don't know you, who are unsure of you, I pray that you would make them so sure. I pray that the picture of you would be so clear. And I pray that you would terrify them, terrify us. Let us know that you are not like us. You are wholly other. You're in a category all of your own, but yet you sent someone in your image and in ours that we might relate to you so that our souls might be saved and ransomed. Father, thank you.
as we come to your table to partake of communion, as we are reminded of your glory and your holiness being condescended and wrapped in human flesh, I pray you would help our hearts to believe and remember that which you've done for us. Lord Jesus, we love you so much. That's your name we pray. Amen.